What's up, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls around the world? I would like to welcome you back to another episode of the Real Talk with Zuby podcast. Now, on today's episode, we have got on the policy director of the Sound Money Defense League, and this is JP Cortez. Welcome to the show, man. Hey, Zuby. Thanks for having me on, man. Great to be here with you. Happy to have you here. I've just done a very brief intro there, JP, but tell people a little bit about who you are and what exactly it is that you do. Yeah. So thank you for having me on first. Um, So yeah, like you mentioned, my name is JP Cortez. I run uh, a public policy group called the Sound Money Defense League. Uh, This is a public policy group that primarily focuses on constitutional sound money, that is to say uh, gold and silver, which are both mentioned um, in the constitution. Uh, But here, me personally, I'm a a big Bitcoin fan, a big fan of sound money and all the things that sound money promises. Uh, So we go state to state. It's a primarily a, a state policy uh, project. So I'll go state to state introducing legislation to eliminate taxes on gold and silver, to uh, establish in-state depositories, to bolster state pension funds or taxpayer reserve funds with gold and silver. Um, so we we work to remove all of the disincentives in the way of people getting into and out of sound money if they choose. Um, so there's there's that policy part. And obviously, that's very important. And over the last six or seven years now, we've I've, I've worked to pass to write legislation and to pass legislation in uh, more than a dozen states at this point, uh, doing several different things. And so the policy part is obviously important, but the education part is something that I've been leaning in more and more to uh, over the last couple of years. The, the reality is um, there are 8000, about 8000 elected state legislators in the United States most of which have never heard the term sound money, most of which have never really thought about what money is and where it derives its value. And so this opportunity to, to testify at hearings and to take meetings with legislators, uh, I think is, is equally as important as actually passing legislation, introducing, introducing people to these ideas and, and bridging the disconnect between you know, what money printing is and, and how that flows downward and, and effectively hurts, harms the poorest among us uh, this is not something that's regularly understood. So having the opportunity to 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 write and to speak, uh, you know, you were at Freedom Fest last week. I was at Freedom Fest last week, both having the opportunity to speak on on, you know, what it is that we're doing. Um, and so sharing the message is is equally as important as as the policy work itself. Mm hmm. OK, so let's uh, let's go over some basics here, because this is not a financial expert. I'm not going to assume that anyone listening to this podcast knows all of these financial terms. You yourself have said that many elected officials do not. So Mm -hmm. there's a phrase you've used multiple times. You say sound money. What exactly does the term sound money actually mean? When I say sound money, I'm talking about uh, sound money in the Austrian tradition, the the tradition that was born in in Karl Menger, Ludwig von Mises, Murray Rothbard, uh, Hayek and Hazlitt. Um, And this is simply the idea that it's a money based on market forces. Uh, So this is not a money that was, you know, there wasn't a government agent that waved the wand and said, gold and silver are money. These these gold and silver historically have been money for thousands of years, not because of the the stamp of approval that a government lackey handed down, but rather because these are monies that have been tested by the market with that self-correcting mechanism that's inherent in free markets. And over thousands of years, it has it's it's a store of value. It has retained value. Um, so gold and silver, Bitcoin. These are examples of sound money. Uh, examples of unsound money would be uh, uh, puka shells, uh, small stones, uh, little glass beads, and of course the U.S. Federal Reserve note, commonly known as the dollar today. Um, and so sound money. That's kind of what sound money is, it, it, as far as like a technical definition. Um, but there are there are two main value props to to what the the benefit that sound money uh, provides. Uh, The first is that um, as a question of, uh, as an investment tool, sound money reduces uncertainty, right? So if if you and I are trying to plan a year from now, five years from now, 10 years from now, 30 years from now, doing that with an unstable money becomes incredibly difficult. If, If we don't know what the value of money is going to be 10 years from now, you and I can't sign a contract that would, for example, uh, work to build the infrastructure in the city in which you and I live. Mm-hmm. You and I wouldn't be able to to develop all of the the basic fundamental things that uh, that a society needs to grow. That is to say, um, the basic infrastructure, uh, roads, financial systems, schools, all of these things. 
and these these products, these uh, institutions grow through the process of capital accumulation. People are able to store their wealth because they know that its value will retain over the long term. And through the course of that, people are able to plan and invest and save in a way that benefits themselves, in a way that benefits society. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's the first big uh, tenet of sound money. Okay. The second just, is- Just to jump in right there, yeah, yeah. Um, based off that concept, would you consider Bitcoin to be sound money? Because we don't know where it's mm -hmm. going to be in a year from now, let alone mm -hmm. five years, 10 years, 10 years, 20, 20 years, and so on. So I'm a fan of Bitcoin myself, mm -hmm. but I'm not sure it would meet that first, um, I'm not sure it would meet that first requirement as it currently stands. Yeah, I think that that's a that's a really good point. And I'm not sure that I could argue that it does meet that standard today. Uh, what I can say, and, and the, the major difference there between something like Bitcoin and something like the US dollar is that there's a fixed supply. Mm -hmm. I don't have to wonder what the technocrats of the world are going to do to manipulate the supply or the, vi the value or the price of Bitcoin. I, this is not a concern of mine. Um, similarly to, to gold and silver, right? The, these are precious metals. And yeah, you can get into potentially um, artificial gold or, or you know, a, 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 a comet comes and, and hits earth and it's full of gold. So potentially there, at least in theory, there are ways in which the gold supply could increase. Mm -hmm. um, but this is a fundamentally different process than uh, people on the PhD standard, a bunch of, you know, highly credentialed people coming together and saying, oh, we know what's best for the world. We know what's best for this monetary system. And we're going to carry out our will through, you know, without the consent of the governed, without any real appreciation for how inflation and how monetary policy hurts the, the most vulnerable among us. Um, and so that I would say that that's a difference um, between something like Bitcoin that makes Bitcoin to me err more on the side of sound money, because mm -hmm. yeah, it hasn't happened yet, but I know what the I know what the supply chart is, and I know that I think it's 20, 2050, whatever whatever the year is, um, I, I can rest assured that there are X amount of Bitcoin in the world. There will never be any more. Mm -hmm. I can't say that about the dollar. Sure. So is that the is the fixed supply? Is that the second term that determines sound money? I know I, I interrupted you there. You were coming to a second point, but was yeah, that no, the second so, point? Yeah, it wasn't going to be a fixed supply, though generally that is what allows a money to retain its value. Mm -hmm. um, but the second part of what makes sound money so important is that it acts against it. It acts as defense against a government that would otherwise spend recklessly. So sound money uh, serves uh, sound money serves as guardrails. There, it's it's a bulwark for a government that would otherwise you know spend recklessly on, for example. Uh, uh, giant wars that are decades long that we don't have a lot to show for, for example, the Middle East most recently. Um, and then so Ukraine, for example, another good example of Americans or at least the American leaders printing and sending tens of billions of dollars to Ukraine, a country that is obviously struggling, but that has a long history of financial mismanagement. And so now recently over the last couple of days, I don't know if you've seen some of these large um, publications have been talking about, hey, wait, should should we have been giving Ukraine this money? Have we thought anything at all about maybe how the money is being spent? Is there any sort of audit system? Is there any sort of give me an itemized report of where this money is going? Mm -hmm. But in in typical American fashion, I think there is nothing in the way of accountability as far as spending or really as far as much of anything. Yeah. So we'll, we see that the moral hazard that's introduced there when you don't have to actually worry about the money because you can just print more at any time uh, leads to bad decisions. And mm -hmm. again, that could be things like war. There could be things like uh, domestic policies that that tend to, um, you know, hurt hurt the poorest people among us. There are, you know, billions of dollars, maybe yeah, billions of dollars that were spent on, for example, the war on drugs. Um, and this is, you know, uh, what was a, a government policy of targeting black and brown people for smoking pot or whatever it is and and the money and the resources and the time that goes into all of this isn't commensurate with the value derived from what the policy is supposed to do so if sound money stops these things if sound money puts uh you know guardrails on what a government is allowed to do without without the consent of the governed 
then mm-hmm. then sound money is ultimately what keeps these massive government institutions from from wreaking havoc all over the world. Maybe this is me being pessimistic, but isn't that uh isn't that the goal? I mean, nations used to have a more sound money system because these currencies, the pound, the dollar, et cetera, they used to be pegged to gold. But as anyone who knows the, the little bit of history about the monetary system, they went off the gold standard. And now we just have this fiat currency system where, as you've alluded to, the Fed or any other central bank can just play with the supply as much as they want to, oftentimes in a very opaque manner. There's not much transparency and for people to see, okay, how many dollars are being printed every day? What exactly is going on? As you said, there's there's no receipts. There's very little accountability. So why why is it? In your opinion, why do you think that is that countries moved off the gold standard to begin with? I think, I think th- what you just asked there is is so important to understand, and I like the way you asked it because the question wasn't why did the gold standard fail, mm-hmm. because the gold standard didn't fail. Politicians realized if they took off their shackles, they'd be able to have more fun. <laughs> Yeah, And so they got rid of the connection between any sort of real semblance of reality between like an actual thing of value being gold or, or a basket of goods or whatever it mm. is and realized, wait, if, if we don't, if we don't have this, you know, parent in the room, we can do whatever we want. And it's been that, that slow creep from, you know, uh, you can start really back in the civil war, back at the, the legal tender acts, um, and then from there, the, the the establishment of the Federal Reserve in 1913. From there, in in 33, FDR outlawing banning gold and um, by executive order. And then in 71, uh, Nixon closing the gold window. And so now we're here today, right? Mm-hmm. And what we've seen is just this massive blow up in government spending. Um, and now we're we're seeing the very obvious implications of that, consequences of that, right? Uh, wealth disparity is higher than it's ever been uh, maybe before. Uh, the Cantillon effects that that are explained in the Austrian school about how central economic governing bodies, when they print money, the the people who who benefit the most from this newly printed money are the people already entrenched in these powers, mm-hmm. uh, the politicians, the bankers, the financiers. And these are the ones that are getting money long before inflation catches up. So by the time, you know, the, if the Fed prints money today and, and by the time it works its way into the economy and down to us, we're not getting those cheap prices of newly printed money. Inflation mm-hmm. is already caught up by the time it gets to us. And that's so, something that, that's something so important for people to understand because I, I don't think a lot of people know that that's the cantillon effect correct Mm -hmm. yeah that's uh richard cantillon he was a french economist um and yeah and so and i think that's what that really speaks to the importance of of the education part of what the sound money defense league is doing Mm -hmm. because there's a disconnect because i think most americans probably most people around the world and i'd say most american politicians even elected politicians believe that if you're printing money something good is going to happen, right? You're printing money to to help someone, to save someone, to, mm-hmm. to, to help someone get out of poverty without any, you know, consideration or understanding for, wait, no, hang on. You're doing, you're doing this backwards. It's the printing of money that's hurting people. But, but it's hard to understand, or rather American politicians and probably politicians around the world are having a really hard time understanding that, you know, uh, maybe it is, well, actually, no, it's not. It's not Ukraine's fault. And mm-hmm. it's not Putin's fault. And it's not the CEO of Kroger's fault. And it's not the CEO of ExxonMobil's fault. Have y'all considered maybe for a second not printing trillions of dollars of unbacked currency? Mm-hmm. Like, is, is anyone in the room going, hmm, have we thought about doing this? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't. <laughs> this is where I often often get into uh, debates and disagreements with people because I, I don't generally think these things are mistakes at that level. I think that they know what they're doing. And I think either they don't care or it's intentional. I think that the destruction is intentional. I don't believe that someone can be working in such a position and someone can be working in the in the Federal Reserve or, or leading it or running a central bank and they, they genuinely don't know, they're not aware that printing huge amounts of money um, in a short space of time is going to jack up inflation. Um, I, I don't believe that they're that stupid. I think a lot of people would like to believe that they are. Um, but to me, that is people knowing what they're doing 
and just disregarding the consequences. Yeah, and I, I totally agree. And I think it speaks to how modern economics, as it's understood and practiced today, is closer to ideology than actual social science, mm -hmm. right? These are, this is, this is what it looks like here in America at 9.1 uh, inflation. And that number is probably tampered it's, down. It's, I'm it's higher. Yeah, yeah. We'll just, <laughs> no, we'll just go ahead and just no say it. It's, it's higher. 9%. It's anyone higher. Who, anyone who is in the real world knows that it's more. No, than absolutely. Than right. Yeah. And so the thing is like, the system is working the way it was designed to do so. There is there isn't anything going wrong with what the Fed is doing. This is how it's built, and this is what it's supposed to do. Um, and so, you know, the, the the Janet Yellens and the Jerome Powells of the world, no, I don't I don't think they think they're doing bad. In fact, I think they're probably thinking that they're doing God's work. But like all of that stems from like an ideology that's wrong, and the idea this like Keynesian idea that you can deficit spend your way into prosperity and that technocrats can control the world and centrally plan it in such a way that there is no poverty. There is no, you know, no one is suffering. We, we can lift, we can lift everyone up through, through the, the, the machinations of a central planner. And, and like that in itself is just so fundamentally understands or so fundamentally misunderstands, you know, what we're doing here, how economies come to be, what money is, what value is. And eventually, you know, it's unsustainable. There, there's real harm here caught at the end of all of this. Mm -hmm. And it's it, okay. No, it, so, it, go it, ahead. It, no. So what I was just going to say is that like, and, and that's what makes the double speak we've been seeing so much as, as it's a moral failing, right? So inflation itself is a moral failing in that this is a policy choice. You know, the government has, the government and the Federal Reserve have decided we're going to make life more expensive for people that are already struggling to afford housing, food, medicine, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and, but that hinges on the promise that, oh, you know, the, the government will save you. They'll, they'll give you stimmies. They'll, uh, they'll give you tax breaks. They'll, they'll do whatever it is, lower prices of things. And so all of this hinges on, oh, don't worry, the government will come save you. But to the single mother in, in, in inner city, that's, has several kids and is already struggling to afford X, Y, or Z, empty promises coming from community theater actors in DC, you know, in penguin suits, don't actually affect the livelihood of this person that is in this moment struggling. And the and the politicians are actively making it worse. Mm -hmm. And so, so and so that's what going back to the double speak, right? So um the we saw at the very beginning maybe 18 months ago maybe longer than that now transitory is the phrase that we heard all the time <laughs> but actually even before that right there was no inflation for a long yes, time no, no there is no inflation mm -hmm. and then well it is happening but it's actually not that bad mm -hmm. and then well it is happening but it's actually good for you and let me explain to you how this benefits <laughs> you and it's it's insane. And now, like most recently, we're redefining the, the term recession mm -hmm. and this, this long, this long held understanding sort of of how mainstream economists and generally people focused on the economy are studying these things. Suddenly, these definitions are no good. It's happening in real time. The, the double speak, the Orwellian process of this, we're seeing it happen every day today. Yes. And like, <clears throat> so, so when you have these, these sort of what look like it's not sleight of hand it's sleight of tongue i suppose it's it's funky it's it's funky movement. it's lying it, yeah, <laughs> yes. okay. yeah. it's lies and deception yeah. that's and what it is that's, and that's exactly what it is yeah. it, it it is it is an untruth um and i've i've said before and and i think i said it um on that panel uh, at freedom fest that second to language money is the single most like interpersonal interconnected tool that human beings regularly use to communicate mm -hmm. right there 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 is very little that that doesn't touch money um th this and and money itself and prices themselves they're all signals that, that it's all information and so if you um so going back to the the language being being incredibly important so like when you manipulate money you can see very clearly you know People are hurting, uh, people are losing their jobs, people are unable to pay medical bills, whatever it is. And this is what it looks like when you manipulate money. Mm -hmm. And seeing people manipulate language is a little bit harder, but we've gotten in the last couple months, several really good examples 
of what it looks like when like the rules of the game are actively changing when when language is communi- is is uh manipulated this way when money is manipulated this way people are unable to to make decisions and to plan because the signals that money and language are providing are being obfuscated by a government that's obfuscating intentionally mm-hmm. and so you have the system in which people are regularly hurt by these policies without really understanding how they're being hurt or that it's actively happening on purpose to them I hear that. So with your organization, what is it that you're doing? How are you trying to help and equip people with the tools? And what sort of policies are you trying to put in place to slow this slow this bleed? So I think first, like on a on a very sort of broad scale, what I believe in and what I do professionally stems from the idea that the federal government is not going to help you. Mm-hmm. Um Mitch McConnell is not going to wake up one morning and say, wow, sound money sounds great. We should totally go back to that. Nancy Pelosi yeah. is not in Taiwan right now talking to <laughs> talking to people about how we should restore sound money. Right. So no. this isn't this isn't naturally going to happen. And that speaks to like American politicians generally as a whole being a very reactive group. Mm-hmm. Government itself is a reactive institution. To be fair, just just to jump in here, what, mm-hmm. it, this is the case all over the globe, isn't it? I mean, is there maybe there's an exception? Is there any country at the moment that uses sound money or that is still on the gold standard? Because as far as I'm aware, we just have a series of fiat standards ranging from quite bad to absolutely <laughs> terrible, <laughs> right? Yeah, I mean, no, the, I think... the, U, the U.S. is one of the best in mm-hmm. the world in terms mm-hmm. of currency stability and lower inflation and even that is uh that's not great but not, you know, i'm from the uk the, the the pound is the same thing is happening with the pound same mm-hmm. thing is happening with the euro mm-hmm. all of them it's it's the same thing everywhere unless there's an exception that i may not know no i don't think there is an exception but i think there's worth it's worth noting that like you mentioned the us is probably you know the one of the highest you know most well respected quote unquote central bank fiat systems that exists today. Mm -hmm. But the reason it exists so strongly is not through any benefit of the fiat system itself, but rather from the privilege that comes with being a reserve currency and being able to weaponize monetary policy to hurt your friends or to help your allies. Mm -hmm. It's not that the dollar itself is all that great. It's that America has largely been a bully for decades Mm. and strong. And so these systems, a lot of these systems are based on the American dollar. They use the American dollar to transact in. So yeah, there's a lot of leverage there um, for, for Americans, for America to, to sort of position yourself, position themselves as a, you know, global monetary leader. Mm -hmm. But that's not because the money itself is any good. It's because of everything else, the weapons, the land, the resources, the, the, the position in, in world history, right? So like the money itself is not necessarily something to, to be super excited about. And so the federal, the answer is not going to come from the federal level. And I think understanding that is a big part of this, but that doesn't mean that there aren't things that you and I could do, or that there aren't things that individual states can do to help mitigate some of this damage that is largely coming from the federal level. Mm -hmm. You can adopt your own gold standard, you know, do what you need to do to protect your loved ones and your family with the understanding that we're in an inflationary environment and it doesn't look like it's going to stop anytime soon. So, so we can thump our chest and and beg the, the politicians on Capitol Hill to please fix this problem for us. But I don't think that that's like an effective or a, a good use of time. Uh, so what I largely do, what we do, is on the state level, and all of this—it's simply removing the disincentives. I, I, you know, asking for a federal government or a state to, uh, you know, reinstitute a gold standard or to declare Bitcoin or gold and silver legal tender, um, m- misunderstands the point. As, I mean, especially in the case of Bitcoin, this—the whole point is—is is so that it's a government or it's a money outside of government. Uh, money that cannot be manipulated. So going from state to state and, and running around DC asking politicians to, you know, please approve my new money, my my, my anti-government money. I'd really appreciate it if I had the government stamp of approval, mm-hmm. which is all legal tender is. It's a, it's a made up designation that gives non-monetary, yeah, gives monetary properties to non-monetary assets. Mm-hmm. So it, uh, legal tender is just this, this made up thing. And so asking 
asking, begging the feds or the state to to accept your new money uh, sort of misses the point. But that isn't to say there aren't things that states can do. So, for example, there are several states here where if you buy precious metals, if you buy a gold coin, a silver coin, you're going to get hit with sales tax on that. Mm -hmm. And then when you sell it, you're going to get hit with capital gains tax on the state and the federal level. Okay. Um, and so there are all of these disincentives to the, the friction into getting into and out of of gold and silver and and Bitcoin, for example, taxation being one of those uh, main frictions. Um, there are uh, in several states, there are a lot of really onerous laws about like we call them dealer harassment laws, where if you are a dealer in a state trying to sell a coin um, and you walk in and you want to buy a coin from me. I'll, I'll sell you the coin, but I'm going to take down all your information, your your hair, your skin, your eyes, your your facial hair, any noticeable features. And then uh, I'm going to upload all this information into the local police, uh, the, the local police database, and then they will hold on to this information and they can use it or not use it as they see fit. And so mm -hmm. all of these all of these, uh, you know, they essentially become they carry water for the feds that the. the Similarly to what we've seen in other cases, the feds like to impose uh, regulations or rules on states or individual businesses to be the bag man for what the feds want to do. You know, COVID is a good example of this where, yes. you know, uh, the, the feds said these are the policies. This is how you have to lock down. This is who and who is not allowed into a restaurant. And then they were relying on the 16 year old hostess working at the restaurant to enforce these these horrible rules that many times like I come on, you you can't Joe Biden cannot ask the, the high schooler working part time at a restaurant to enforce uh, covid lockdown rules. Yes. And it, it's a moral failing. Mm -hmm. And so like there are there are a lot of different ways in which the, the feds rely on states or individuals or businesses to 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 roll out what it is that the feds are trying to do. Um, and so, so that's kind of I like that. You just call them the feds. Cause it sounds like a gang, which is what they are. <laughs> they are. Yeah. They are right? <laughs> hey, that's not I, me. I know, I, I, that's rock bard. That's I, me. Sis. That's <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, I'm repeating things. <laughs> I know. It just, it just makes me laugh. Cause it, 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 put, it puts it in the right context. Cause of course, if you, uh, if you were to swap that word out with like, you know, like any, any sort of gang name or mafia name. Mafia. It's, uh, yeah. Yeah. And so like you, so the the point or the goal is not to get the government, uh, state or federal, to to accept or to restore sound money. It's to get the feds and the state out of the way. Mm -hmm. Let people interact. Let people transact. Let people do save in in the methods and the ways that they want to save. And like ultimately, that bleeds that bleeds the government of power. This this Federal Reserve note is such a powerful instrument that the the fed and the federal reserve uses or excuse me the feds and the federal reserve use to to hopefully or in their eyes to to end up with different results right and so it's it's a tool of manipulation we can give a little here to our allies we can take a little here from our enemies uh we can impose this tax or this restriction here or there and so it's a, it's a tool of control and so by allowing gold silver bitcoin whatever it is, allowing those to compete, you know, mm. offering the, the possibility of competing currencies. I think we'll see, like, I'm not, I'm not even necessarily talking about me and you, man. I'm, but there's a reality to like, there are poor people struggling all around the world that non sound money, that fiat money, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, this allows and empowers these systems that hurt people, you know, massive wars throughout the country, these inflation rates, like there are actually people, there are actual people suffering at the end of all of this. This isn't, you know, some sort of uh, uh, a PhD exercise in, in theoretical economics, right? Mm -hmm. And there is no level of like, oh, if we just keep tweaking our recession or excuse me, our regression, we're going to get, we're going to get the answer right. And then all of a sudden everyone's going to be rich and happy. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that misunderstands how the world works. I hear that. So what is it that the average person doing? I'm sure there are going to be people listening to this thinking, okay, well, this kind of sucks. And they're feeling the pain of the inflation and the, the recession. And they're going to be wondering, okay, well, what do, what do I do? What can we, the people do? 
we don't control the money system at the federal level. We don't even control much at the state level. Yeah. Uh, we depend, regardless of wherever someone is. I mean, it's it's hard enough in the USA, but uh, for people who are outside of it, especially in developing countries, what can people actually do to start taking some of that power back? I think a lot of it is, like I mentioned earlier, it's it's adopting your own gold standard. Um, it's understanding that the feds are not going to save you. And so, excuse me, um, investing in physical gold and silver, um, trying to to invest or save in assets that you think will be able to wist or withstand or yeah, withstand some of this inflation. And that can mm -hmm. be land, commodities, um, you know, gold and silver, Bitcoin, all of these things. And so I think, and like Bitcoin is a very exciting, uh, as as especially as it pertains to third world countries or emerging markets, where, you know, in in Nigeria, for example, you hear, um, you know, women's groups that are using uh, Bitcoin to crowdsource uh, big projects against uh, police brutality, for example, mm -hmm. because you can't use the, you can't use the the currency of the land to to fight against a government that doesn't want you fighting against them. In Hong Kong, we're seeing a lot of that as well. You've got people that are fighting up against this government. Bank accounts are being seized. Uh, assets are being seized. Um, and so the things like Bitcoin and things that operate outside of the traditional financial system work. They, they serve as a lifeline for these people in many cases. Mm -hmm. Canada being another great example of protesters waking up one morning and finding out that they've been financially othered, that suddenly oh, Trudeau just unilaterally decided to take all our stuff? What do you mean? It's crazy. And it's, it's infuriating and it speaks to the need. It speaks to the need for trustless societies. These are institutions that don't require a good or a noble person in charge in order for them to be working properly. And gold standards and things like Bitcoin are really good in that they reduce trust. I don't need Jerome Powell to be an Austrian economist and to understand Cantillon effects. Mm -hmm. For him, I don't I don't need for him to understand that if there are the guardrails that keep him within, you know, operating within a, a certain degree of of monetary policy. But there is nothing in the way of restraint there. Um, and so I have to trust Jerome Powell. I have to trust Janet Yellen. I have to trust Joe Biden because these institutions hinge on trust. So the answer is not necessarily voting the right person into office or, you know, uh, uh, allowing the the next smart PhD to come out and and head the Federal Reserve, that ultimately can't be what the answer is. the The answer has to be creating institutions that don't rely on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a big um, it's a big uphill battle. I mean, it's interesting because this is one of the areas in terms of money where it seems that humanity has gone backwards. Actually, mm -hmm. that we the money we use now is less sound than the money we used 100 years ago or even a thousand years ago in many cases which is strange because normally we're always improving with mm -hmm. technology but in this case we've we, we've had the opposite and it's something that i mean it's it's complicated a lot of people don't sure. know it because they don't I don't know, like when when you start having conversations about finances and investing and ice glaze over money. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. It, people are like, that's that's complicated. Just give me my dollars, give me my pounds, mm -hmm. give me my euros. And mm -hmm. people don't really even with inflation. I mean, it, it, I think it's good that people are talking about inflation now. I mean, yeah. I was uh, it's something I was trying to highlight in 2020 and 2021 as an eventual consequence of all the policies that people mm -hmm. were advocating for then. And not very many people were particularly interested mm -hmm. in hearing what I had to say. They just thought I wanted um, everybody and their grandmas to to die of a virus. Die. Yeah. Um, but, and on top of that, all of the experts were saying you were wrong. Yes. All the experts were. over and over. Uh, everything from COVID to economics to yep. medicine to nutrition to health <laughs> to public schooling to war. Yeah. On and it's, on and on. It's, it's crazy. Um, and the thing with the government as, as well is that when it comes to the government, I think this is one of the only institutions, there might be a handful of ex other ones, but it's really one of the only institutions where number one, the more it fails, the bigger it gets. Mm -hmm. And also that people do not lose trust and faith in it. That's one of the strangest, it's, it's one of the strangest things because on an individual level or even with a, even with um a company with the exception of um 
the, the gods at Pfizer and Moderna and so on. If you if you are caught constantly lying or not doing what you said you would do or having products that don't do what they say they're going to do or so on, people lose people lose trust in you. And after a while, that that trust is gone. And, you know, if, if you've got a con man who's out in a city and he's genuinely just just conning people, right? He's selling people fake goods or he's selling people things that that blow up when you plug them in or whatever it is. You can do that for like a short time and then very mm -hmm. quickly word gets around, hey, this guy's a con man. You can't yeah. trust him. Don't buy his stuff. And mm -hmm. it, and he fails. He doesn't become more powerful and people put more mm -hmm. trust in him and people expect him to be the one who's going to fix everything. But that's what seems to happen with governments. And that's mm -hmm. how they've even become so large and overreaching over time. And there's just more and more and more laws. I mean, no one can even nobody in any in any developed country even knows even knows what all the laws are you you can't mm -hmm. i yeah, mean it's we should yeah you shouldn't need i don't know i feel like you you should need a couple dozen laws at most um probably like three or four like very basic ones mm -hmm. and then maybe a, a a dozen or two that are a little more specific and in depth mm -hmm. but we've just, we've just got i don't, I don't know I, I would love for someone to actually tell me how many laws exist within a country like the Endless, usa okay. because yeah. it, it must just be it wouldn't shock me if it's tens of thousands or a hundred thousand plus and similarly the tax code is equally as convoluted and you know mm -hmm. it, it takes and that's that's part of it right like you need in order to understand this really convoluted system that has been built because it's not like america or it's not like politics or government has to function this way no. it just so happens that this is a system under which we live and it is it is literally impossible. You need uh, a master's in accounting and you need a law degree and you need, uh, you know, ethics and philosophy degree. You need all of them. You need all of them just to understand the rules in the in the place in which you live, which is it is mind blowing. Mm -hmm. And so I think, um, <clears throat> excuse me, what you were just saying there about uh, trust. And I think this is a um, I think Hoppe touches this a little bit in his um, Democracy, the God that Failed, is this idea that democracy fails in part because of this system in which every two years, every four years, people can say, oh, no, this was no good. We'll just bring in the next guy and he'll fix it mm -hmm. or she'll fix it. And so it's just a constant absolution, constantly absolving one politicians because the idea is, oh, well, they're no good. Just get them out. Who cares? Mm -hmm. We'll get we'll get a good one next time. And it absolves the individual of any sort of responsibility they had for who they chose to vote for. So, for example, like Trump Biden is a good example here of, you know, countless people came out and said, hey, I'm not voting for Biden. I'm voting mm -hmm. against Trump, which fine, whatever. Mm -hmm. But the reality is three years ago, Americans were a lot better off than they are today in That's... just about every discernible metric. Yep. Which isn't to say that. Trump is really great or that Biden is necessarily really horrible, but like this sort of back and forth and like it, it becomes closer to sports, right? You're just rooting for your team. <laughs> and then when your team wins, yeah, my team's the best. When the other guy team wins, oh man, those guys are the worst. They cheated. Mm -hmm. They, and like it, it becomes it closer to community theater than any sort of like system of governance. Mm -hmm. What do you think would be a better option? Because democracy as it currently stands is this, you know, I know that the USA is technically a constitutional republic, as people like to say. Um, mm -hmm. But with this concept of democracy, I think it's interesting because it's very much a, it's it's an absolute sacred cow. I mean, if you live in mm -hmm. a Western country, the idea that democracy is not absolutely the best way it's of doing percent, things. Yeah, yeah it, it's very sacred. Um, and there are there are some in many there are many, there are many flaws with it, some of which we haven't discussed. But the question, of course, is well, what's what's the alternative? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, in your mind, if this were not the you've said this this way of doing things is suboptimal with having this back and forth every every couple of years, and it just becomes very tribal, and the ping pong ball bounces back and forth, and nothing really gets done or moves forward. What do you think would be, in theory or in practice, a better system? First, I would, I would ask you or whoever is whoever is asking me, uh, how do you define better, right? So, like, okay, at, 
at least in in the Austrian school, subjective value is at the crux of of the entire understanding of the world, right? Human beings act rationally. They they uh, they use their ends to achieve desired means, um, and and that's what rationality is, and that's what um, subjective value is. And so, you know, I think importantly, it's about choice. It's about the voluntary system in which uh -huh. you know you choose, or if you want to leave, you can leave. Um, but you know, this, for example, you never signed the constitution. The social contract theory is, is, you know, a made up, it's a fiction. You, you yes. don't, you have no obligation to, I, I don't, maybe your family, your closest friends, but the idea that, you know, you're in DC right now and you, I think would call yourself what a, a conservative uh, commentator, conservative libertarian, I, However you I, want to define however, that. However people sure. want to call me, I don't yeah. care. Yeah, yeah. So however <laughs> you want to define that. And, you know, so you're in D.C. right now. Um, there is, you know, a, a, a trans woman in Portland right now with a very successful OnlyFans that is, you know, very heavily tattooed and, and body modifications and just lives their life in a way that is completely incongruent with maybe you or maybe me or or whoever it is mm -hmm. and so the i the idea is hey i don't necessarily want that person speaking for me and they probably don't want me speaking for them mm -hmm. so what is this arrangement in which like from from thousands of miles apart we're forced to collectively be one it doesn't it doesn't make sense um mm -hmm. and so you hear you know the term soft secession uh, national divorce um and I think ultimately, ultimately, I think all of those things are what will happen. Um, and I think all those things happening are are a net benefit to the world we live in, because the point of doing those things is to avoid the civil war, is to avoid the the larger conflict. And so breaking up, you know, if, you know, me and my girlfriend want to break up now and, and do it kindly, or we can wait 10 years till we're at each other's throats and and wanting to kill each other in each other's sleep. Mm -hmm. Um you know, it doesn't it doesn't make sense to continue to see that the, the worldviews, the multiple worldviews, because it's not just two. This isn't a binary dichotomous thing. There are 350 million people in this country. Mm -hmm. So as far as I'm concerned, there are 350 million countries. Right. Mm -hmm. The individual is the smallest minority. And, and so right. Right. <laughs> 300, <laughs> 350 million of those. <laughs> the reality is like you and I right now are 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 in an anarchist relationship, right? Mm -hmm. You're choosing to be here willingly. I'm choosing to be here willingly. And there's nothing compelling us or forcing us to, to interact with people that we don't like or that we otherwise wouldn't want to interact with. And so like having, having a government come in and tell you, no, you have to play nice with these people or no, you have to do this with that. I don't believe that's like a, a moral or, or an efficient or an ethical use or power of government so mm -hmm. let people break up ideally you know people choose people choose the way they want to live their churches their schools their grocery stores uh their bars let them decide those things with the understanding that oh there doesn't have to be a one size fits all for 350 million people mm -hmm. i mean i would say that the usa has done a well, a better job than any other place or time at doing that. I mean, as far as liberty goes, people have a lot of freedoms here. Um, yes, in terms of the governance structure, there are things that people can vote on in this place and that affects the other person and so on and so forth. But I mean, outside of a truly anarchist system, I don't know if that is what you're necessarily advocating. Um, if it is, I'd be curious to how you think it would sort of work at a, at a deeper level. Um, but without going that far, where is that, where's that balance? What should the government be doing? We think we've talked a lot about what it shouldn't be doing, but if it is to exist, what should it be doing? Do you think? Um, so I think there are a couple of different potentials here. So for example, the, the minarchist ideology sort of believes that, um, I think it's courts, army and police okay. and government should not do anything but these really small slivers of you know publicly provided good okay what and about that, what about immigration i think 
I I think as far as the the minarchist belief, okay. uh, that would fall under like police and okay. um, police and army. Okay. But I hear that, and I I hear a, a political system that wants to put wants to to completely rid the government of all power except for the three most important things that they mess up worse than anything <laughs> so th that that doesn't add up to me this that makes opposite sense if anything give them everything else let them let them decide lima beans and shoestrings and all of these let give them that <laughs> i'd rather them have that and mess that up than mess up policing or mess up wars because they're very they're very good at doing that <clears throat> so um but but me personally, I think just like I mentioned, right? We're we're a city or a, a country um full of sovereign sovereign individuals that you know if if you believe in if you believe in God that you know that your rights were your rights were given to you by by a higher power. If you don't believe in God, your rights are just part of you as as a part of your humanity. But in either case, the government is not one, I think, to decide or to rule on on what we can and can't do. So I guess that that's kind of a, a big broad answer, but I again, the with the, with the I, I get what you're saying. I mean, I, I lean libertarian myself, but you know, I often wonder because when we say, oftentimes people will say statements like the government shouldn't tell us what we can and can't do. Mm -hmm. um, which on one level, I'm like, yeah on another i'm like well that's silly i mean of course you know, we we need we need some laws right mm -hmm. we need uh there's the obvious things you know not not murdering hurting sure. stealing rape raping assaulting and so on um it's just i think i think the biggest question of politics really for a lot of people is often where should the lines be drawn and mm -hmm. who draws those lines mm -hmm. is it at a individual level a community level a state level a federal level um and where exactly are those lines because there are things that can hurt and impact people or hurt and impact society that go beyond very obvious things like theft and murder and rape mm -hmm. right there are mm -hmm. there are other things that can you know what about fraud what about fraud what about slander and libel what about uh counterfeiting what about counterfeit goods? What about, you know, there, there are many, there are many different things. So mm -hmm. I, I think this is also why governments and laws have this tendency to, to just grow, to grow because it's always like, well, there's, there's always another what thing, this? right? What about yeah, that? Yeah. What, yeah, what about, but, what about regulation? What about, mm -hmm. okay. Someone wants to build a hotel or build a residency. Mm -hmm. Should, should there be some government oversight of that to make sure that it's, set in case there's a fire and that it, the electricity and wiring is done properly and the, the supports are right and it's not going to just collapse because you know there there can be some cowboy contractors who will just put up put up a building and they don't do what they're supposed to do and people suffer so i think um what you were just saying there that the uh it, it's almost less a question of what is decided and more often a question of who gets to decide, which is where the power really lies. And mm -hmm. I think so, for example, things like rape, murder, uh, you know, the, the big sins. Um, I I personally don't do any of those things, but the reason I don't do them isn't because they're codified in a book somewhere in my state capital. Right. There's mm -hmm. like a, a real morality to, to how one chooses to live their lives. And there's a reality to like, there are those laws, the laws that stop people from murdering and raping and stealing. Those laws already exist. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't stop people from breaking them. I mean, all of these things still exist today. Um, so so maybe that speaks to like how this level it, of governance. It, cer it certainly helps. The law, having the law on hand. Mm -hmm. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, and I'm so uh, which isn't to say that there shouldn't be laws, but I think that um you know, there are cases in which there are laws that are not necessarily compatible with human liberty or or living as freely and joyfully as as one would hope to. Um and so your answer there is to create a system in which like if you don't if you don't like these rules, you can just go somewhere else. You can vote with your feet. You can leave. COVID is a good example of that. War on mm -hmm. drugs is a good example on that. Tax rates is a good example on that. And we're seeing it happen, right? Like yes. 
people are fleeing from Florida or excuse me, from New York. People are fleeing from California to places like Texas and, and Florida. Mm-hmm. Um, so like, you know, should, should there be rules? Absolutely. And I think that, you know, you, you generally need rules, but I think that one, um, allowing people to choose where they want to live. I think generally most people will gravitate towards a system in which there isn't any murder or there isn't theft and there isn't rape. Mm-hmm. Of course. Um, I so guess I think, so, sorry, sorry, to, sorry to jump in. I mean, yeah. I, I feel like what what's being described is what the USA already has. In what way? As in, I mean, you can move if you don't, if you don't like how California is, you can move. If you don't like how New York city is, you can move. Like people ha- already have, this freedom of movement and freedom of speech and freedom of association. Um, sure, of course, there there can be emotional and financial and practical mm-hmm. logistical roadblocks. And mm-hmm. I don't know how you'd avoid that, that being the case, unless you want to uh, finance everyone to go wherever they want, which mm-hmm. is going to create a whole host of other problems. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess my, my question would be what would be changed from the way it currently is, because I think what was just described there is what the U.S. has. And one thing that actually makes the USA special in that you have 50 state options, Mm -hmm. which you don't have in most countries. Is that the way it works in the UK? Can no, you? The, the UK doesn't have states. Well, the UK doesn't have states. Like, so but bouncer, but like with a UK passport, you can bounce around between the, the different, the countries of the UK. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Okay. And, um, when it was, and I mean, if you're, you're in Europe, you've got all of Europe. I mean, if you're within the Eurozone, then, you know, if you're in France and you want to move to Germany, you can. If you're in Germany, you want to move to Portugal, you, you can. There's, you don't even need a, uh, you don't even need a visa. So that already is, yeah, I, f- I feel like that, that, that largely already exists. I, and most people don't take advantage of it, by the way. Yeah. 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 <laughs> most, I, I, most like, people don't do it. it doesn't, yeah. I don't even think it occurs to most people to yeah. like base their life on, you know, uh, designations of freedom. Right. Mm-hmm. I think largely most people wake up in the morning, they go to work, they're worried about paying their bills. They come yeah. home and they go to sleep and they do it again. Mm-hmm. And so like questions about gender questions about drugs, questions about, um, you know, recessions or whatever, the average American is not wasting their time or, or bothering thinking things like this. And mm-hmm. so like, so I think uh, an important part to, to what you were saying is this belief that I have that the federal government is largely you know, a, a pointless institution that doesn't really get anything done. I believe that that's true, but the the actionable part of that is to participate in the bodies that are smaller and uh, will actually affect you. Mm-hmm. So uh, I right now I'm in uh, Idaho. I'm in Boise, Idaho. And, you know, so D.C. is what, 3,000 miles away right now? Mm-hmm. Um I think if I were looking to enact change, if I were wanting to make a difference, I wouldn't be lobbying folks in DC, right? I would come and look, I would come to my community and not even necessarily using the political process, but just look at your community and seeing how you can serve your community better. So like people spend an inordinate, an inordinate amount of time thinking about politics, spending money mm-hmm. about pol- spending money on politics, mm-hmm. uh, deriving entire identities from politics. For and sure. what I'm saying is, if you cared more about your loved ones and your communities and you work to make yourself the best person you can be over spending time on YouTube, listening to Elizabeth Warren or uh, talk about uh, Bitcoin regulations or listening to Nancy Pelosi do this or that, I think you generally will be one more robust as a human being, more well-rounded oh, yeah. and happier. Oh, of course. Without, no, the, no. without <laughs> the weight and the, the, the depression that comes with these institutions that don't serve us. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, no debate there. No debate there at all. I mean, that's a big part of my message. And so I think like going back to being an active participant in in your state legislature where you can actually enact change um, is so important as to why, like what sound money does, you know, the the, the federal level is it's gridlocked. It's a swamp. You're not going to get change there. But there's a reality to state politics in the, or state legislature in that like These are not big offices. These are not offices that are insulated from people. So when you get a call, when you get 20 calls into one state legislature, that switchboard lights up, Mm -hmm. they don't know what to do. They've never had that sort of grassroots pressure. They've never heard from people because generally people don't participate 
in their state legislators, in their state legislatures. Yeah. There's a, a famous quote from a, a former politician, a senator out of Illinois, that's, um, you know, when I, oh, what was it? Um, when I feel when I feel the heat, I see the light, which is okay. this idea that like you have to. I, I need to feel heat in order to see the light. I'm not mm. going, politicians are not going to proactively uh, take up the issues that we care about. You you have to force them. You have to mm. be there knocking on the doors, making the phone calls. And that having, having that sort of level of potential change is infinitely more than any change you'll ever achieve in DC. Um, and you're affecting your actual community. These are the people in your actual life every day. You know, these are people you have more in common with. I have more in common with uh, a state legislator here in Idaho mm -hmm. than I do with Nancy Pelosi or, you know, any any of these uh, big name D.C. Beltway politicians. Mm -hmm. And so, like, uh, just controlling what you can control inside yourself and inside your community, your city, um, and how that protects loved ones, I think, is is a much a much more like moral and meaningful fight than spending your time trying to fight DC. hundred percent, man. I agree with you. JP, man, it's been so good to talk to you. Tell the listeners where they can find and follow you online. Yeah, man, it's been great. Thank you for having me. Uh, so uh, you can find me on Twitter at JP Cortez two seven. Um, and, uh, soundmoneydefense.org is the website. My email is on there as well. JP.Cortez at soundmoneydefense.org. Um, and so yeah, anyone, uh, if anyone listening right now, I'm available to, to chat anytime. If anyone wants to run any policy in a state that is not good on the sound money issue, please reach out. Uh, you know, several of our state projects that we have passed have, were born with a, a concerned citizen that reaches out. And says, "Hey, I know I I see on your list of uh, on your index and or your scorecard. I see that my state is really bad at this. Please, can we work together to introduce and pass some legislation?" And there have been several projects that that started and ended that way. Mm -hmm. um, so, if if anyone's listening, if anyone has any um, any particular concern or um, you know wants to carry legislation like this, uh, please reach out. I'm I'm available anytime. Awesome, JP Cortez. Thank you for coming on the show. Thanks a lot, Zuby.